welcome everyone to the 2016 webinar series. My name is Tracy Earle, I'm from the Safe Communities Foundation New Zealand, and along with Megan Brotherton from the Australian Safe Communities Foundation, we are your hosts for this webinar. Before we start, I'd just like to go through a few housekeeping matters. Um, we have three fantastic presentations today, and we'll have time for questions after each presentation. Two of the presentations are live and one's been pre-recorded, so um, we want there to be some interaction after the live presentation, so please feel free to ask questions. Uh, each participant has access to the GoToWebinar control panel on your screen, so if you could please familiarise yourself with its features. If you do have any problems, please send a message via the control panel and we will endeavour to sort the issue out. If you'd like to ask a question during or at the end of the presentations, please type the question in the question area on the control panel on your screen. Alternatively, you can ask a question by putting your hand up. To do this, click on the yellow hand on your control panel. At the end of each presentation, depending on the time available, the presenters will try to answer your questions. If you have a question and it's not answered, the presenters will provide an email address at the end of their session for you to correspond with them personally. This webinar will be recorded and will be available for viewing next week. So, to move on to our first presenter, I'd like to introduce Nathan Islip, who's the current team leader for urban design in the city of Casey, Australia. In his recognition as a White Ribbon Ambassador, Nathan has presented at numerous conferences and co-authored academic papers on the role of urban design in presenting violence and preventing sorry, violence against women. Today Nathan is going to present on designing a white ribbon world. Good afternoon or morning everyone. Um, thank you for the opportunity to present. This is a body of research that I did um, last year which was really trying to understand uh, how a designer can actually make a difference in this discipline. Uh, when I started at Casey, I was invited to become a member of the Men's Action Group, and I'm now co-chair of that. But initially, when I looked at it, I thought, well, there's probably not much I can do apart from influencing those around me a bit culturally. But when I sat back and reflected on my work area, it became pretty evident that there are interventions that can be done. Uh, which will assist in preventing violence against women. So um, just as a bit of a, a precautionary thing, I will be going through a couple of uh, fairly unpleasant components in this presentation and that might be a trigger for you. I just want you to be aware that you'd like there's support uh, through Lifeline if you need it, um, although I'm not sure what the international um, version of that might be, but obviously if you do feel triggered by some of the content, please don't hesitate to get help because it is something serious. So um, as a result of that Men's Action Group involvement, I became a White Ribbon Ambassador and um, the vision of White Ribbon Organisation is for all women to live in safety free from all forms of men's violence and that shows itself as a mission of making women's safety a man's issue too. Uh, traditionally it's just been too much emphasis on the feminist movement having to carry the uh, burden of trying to enact change. And so this campaign actually tries to use primary prevention initiatives, uh, raises awareness, has education and programs with uh, all different areas. I've taken the oath, in fact uh, ironically I did it just again um, because I've changed the oath um, just to a more clear and succinct version of it and that oath of the White Ribbon Foundation is I will stand up, speak out and act to prevent men's violence against women. It's a men's only organisation primarily because uh, men have been too quiet in this and it's a men's culture issue and men need to be involved in that discussion and I know that that opens up a bit of a can of worms in terms of working collaboratively and I think Our Watch is also a good organisation which has uh, tied together men and women into the same uh, uh, overall goal. What I want to do now is just go through a couple of examples of um, actual cases of women who were murdered last year. Um, this is why I put that trigger warning up because some of these are quite unpleasant. Um, it's not just last year, this is the one that triggered me to really want to immerse myself in understanding what's going on in the public realm when these incidents happen. 
this was uh, dating back to 22nd of September 2012, and it was um, the anniversary last year um, in September, which really got me thinking about this again. And uh, I'm glad that I was invited to present because three years on, um, and we are still struggling with some of the debates around um, how to address uh, this issue. I went and walked along Sydney Road to understand what happened with Jill Ma to try and understand what she might have experienced at 2am that morning and uh, when it, where that incident might have happened with Ada and Brady. It was just a really disturbing um, experience because I could put myself in her shoes to some extent to experience that vulnerability. Um, I had presented this uh, previously last year at a conference and so uh, you can't really see me as a person. but I'm not a big guy, you know, I'm not ripped or anything, so normally um, that is typically the advantage that um, uh, muscular men have, that they have this ability to fend off anything and less likely to be assaulted. Um, but I'm not a big guy and so I feel a sense of vulnerability myself at times when I'm walking streets at night time. And so I can only imagine what it would have been like for Jill, um, who is of the small stature and um, uh, in a sexualized uh, society where uh, men tend to objectify women, that would make her feel even more uh, vulnerable walking along the street at 1.30 a.m. And as I walked along Sydney Road, I really saw dark alcoves, there were um, overhanging awnings. I was looking around and thinking, okay, she's feeling unsafe. Where did she turn? And I was looking up at the buildings around and there were very few uh, windows around uh, above, there was no real um, uh, houses that could see where she was walking, so there's this lack of diversity in the built form. And then she turns her corner to try and get home. You can see on the uh, left-hand side of the, the aerial where she's actually um, living, and she's coming down this laneway here on Hope Street, and it's believed that somewhere around here the assault actually happened, which I went and stood in that spot and it was a little um, car park spot which is indented behind the set of shops. It had a blank brick wall, a high 1.8 metre timber fence, the back of the shops, and straight opposite was a big uh, double storey brick wall, once again no windows on the opposite side of the street. And so there was no surveillance, there was no people, there was no signs of life, and it became um, too easy for that assault to happen in that space where it should have been um, much better designed and there are things we can do. So I, I started looking at, uh, in the first half of last year, what um, happened in the deaths that occurred. And so um, this is just sequentially the first 10 of them. Uh, Tina Fang was found dead with her throat slashed in an Adelaide hotel room and uh, Chang Pao was charged with her murder. Runabel Tiglao, Blackmore, in fear of her life, jumped from a moving car on New Year's Eve and died in hospital on the 2nd of January. Her partner, Shane Dixon, has been charged with the murder. 9th of January, Nikita Chawla, found dead in a unit in Brunswick West. Her husband, Paminda Singh, charged with murder. Uh, by the way, all of these um, cases I'm getting off Destroy the Joint and Counting Dead Women Australia, which are really valuable resources. January 21st, the body of Renee Carter and Corey Croft stabbed to death, found at their house in Upper Coomera. Renee's ex-husband, Christopher Carter, charged with murder. Fabian Palhares, attacked with, a, attacked with an axe in her home at Varsity Lakes, died in hospital. Her ex-partner, Brock Wall, charged with her murder and the death of a 10-week-old fetus. Adele Collins, same sort of story. Kerry Michael, her husband, Robin Michael, charged with her murder. Uh, uh, and uh, is Miguel, found dead at her home. Her husband, Derek. LLB charged with a murder. Tara Costigan killed with an accident at home. Her anarchist repel charged with a murder. So if you put together all of the deaths that happened in the first half of last year, that's a huge amount of deaths right there that you can see. And what I did, I highlighted in dark red whether the perpetrator was male or female or the yellow shows whether it's under investigation. And what you can see is that the vast majority are men and ex-partners of the person. If you look at the location, you can see that there's a, a huge amount that are occurring in the home. But if we break it down, you can kind of see that of the deaths, the perpetrators were 36 males, so five times as many male as there were 
female perpetrators, and this is with six still unresolved. I have tried to check up to see whether there's been any further progress, and at the moment there's no further info on those. But where do these things happen? 29 happened in a home, seven uh, were car related, uh, four were in public space, two were in secluded spaces, and then a smattering of other locations. But that um, primarily says we need to try, try and work out how to make our communities and where people live more connected to try and improve the way that uh, people might get access to help, that someone might hear the incident happening and try and intervene. Um, and sometimes introspective design of our neighbourhoods mean that people don't build relationships with each other. Now that's really relevant for us here in the city of Casey. Um, the city of Casey is a huge population. We've got uh, we're basically the largest municipality uh, uh, in Melbourne, 266,000 population, a huge land area, um, and by 2036 we're expecting us to have 459 based on current population trends, and we've obviously got growth areas, so huge tracts of greenfield land are being developed into new neighbourhoods. That means it will be equivalently Tasmania by that time. Now, um, within Casey, we've got uh, the uh, Darbton area and the Cranbourne area, both of which are really significantly um, or unfortunately overrepresented in disadvantage and are highly represented in some of our um, violence against women statistics. In the 2013-14 year, we had the highest family reports uh, of uh, violence in the state with a total number of 3,754. Um, we have had an increase in the rate of violence against women, uh, which may be to do with the reporting, but it's increasing based on our statistics. There was uh, 1,600 charges laid, that's a huge number of charges, and in that children were present in 1,300 of cases. Uh, there were IVO and safety notices issued um, of 1,009 of them, and we know that those AVOs are commonly breached, which is a real problem. And so it's a massive issue for us in Casey, and we're expecting that there's a heap uh, bigger problem than is already shown. So it's our big issue for the police. So we've got layers of intervention. You can try and prevent it in the public realm through education and culture change. You can try and increase that sense of safety through showing signs of life and passive surveillance. We can try and uh, deal with the issue of what happens when there's a threat to the person. Is there a way to get out of that area? Is there a place of refuge that they can escape to. And then you have the issue of when the incident occurs, can you be heard, can you be seen, and uh, is there any type of social connection to try and intervene in that occurrence. Uh, after the occurrence of the incident, how do you deal with uh, recovery? Is there social contact? Is there access to services? Can you actually get to the crisis housing, or is there any crisis housing available? And then after that, when things settle down a little, can the person uh, can a woman afford to live? Can they get employment to become independent again? And is there public transport? So they're what we believe are layers of intervention. Now you can line the world with leather, or you can line your feet, and preferably we'd prefer to just be lining our feet so everyone takes responsibility for their action. But urban design does have a role. We first of all have uh, four key areas to focus on, and it looks like my time's nearly running out, so I might need to make these slides available after. But the first point, there's two angles. You either have the cultural thing of, well, just don't kill women. It's just a horrendous thing that happens in our society. But if we're looking at a public realm thing, then we need to look at our housing and our streets and encourage people to actually be more social in those spaces. Um, at the moment, it's just unaffordable for women to actually move on and try and become independent. It's uh, incredibly difficult to buy a house, let alone rent, and you can see how the, uh, that is taking up a huge amount of the uh, financial stress for people. And uh, killed on in Uniting Care say that we have become concerned about trends we see in relation to family and financial stress and issues with debt recovery uh, that are occurring within two to five years of families having moved into new growth areas. It increasingly is becoming apparent that there is a growing vulnerability in these estates, and that is a strong trigger for um, violence against women in domestic situations. And even when you look at the housing that's provided, a woman who is trying to flee uh, a situation, we just don't have any one or two bed products being delivered. Even though we know that the population needs it, as you can see by those statistics, like 
we need 43% uh, to be one to two bedroom, but only 7.9% of our product is actually one to two bedroom which is kind of absurd, and that's making it really hard for people. So we've come up with some designs in our housing strategy which are currently being adopted, and um, that's trying to introduce verandas, trying to introduce uh, more extroverted spaces in the front so that the front garden becomes like this semi-public space and that the um, people are more likely to occupy it and be socially connected. That includes in higher density product, trying to get upper level activation, uh, once again, stronger sense of entry and a place where you might put a chair, because the more people occupy the front of a house, the more uh, interaction they're going to have with their neighbours. Even in the highest density product of apartment living, there are really good mechanisms that can be introduced that allow people to have contact with their neighbours and be uh, improving with their sense of safety. Um, these last couple I'm going to just whip through because um, I know time's up, so the social intervention would be bystander intervention and in our activity centres, trying to get multiple uses into those activity centres so that um, it's a safer place rather than, uh, this is in Dubton, at night time this place becomes a wasteland and it's incredibly unsafe. If you want to go and get a dinner at the takeaway, then you're in trouble because there's no one around and you feel very vulnerable. So we did an intervention here. We're looking to fix up this rear laneway, which has got no activation. We're looking to sort out this. We've demolished that toilet block already, which we knew was a crime hotspot, and trying to re remove this shelter as well and open up the space. In our first project in removing that, we um, got, that was, even the cleaners were scared to go in here. And that was the main uh, public space in the shopping centre. We demolished it replaced it with a stainless steel toilet and created a bit of a public space so that people can now occupy that. And we've had a 86% report of improved sense of safety in that space in recent surveys. We still have hotspots, but we'll deal with them eventually. But we'd like to see in that centre upper level activation, multiple uses including businesses and jobs opportunities rather than just a, a, a dumb retail single use function which becomes unsafe at night time and trying to extrovert even the shops so that they address the street. The third um, response is about moving the mask. Men have got to start dealing with the fear that we have of emotion and uh, try to deal with the shame that happens when um, we don't deal with emotion. And this is a really difficult battle to fight. But at the same time, in the public realm, we need to improve the access to shelters and have them to feel like like they are inconspicuous and genuine retreats. Uh, we had a Dubton refuge development just recently that adopted a really progressive approach, which has got good response, but I can't detail that right now. But just as an example, Layla Al Alavi tried to get to 12 different shelters in Sydney before she was finally killed by her husband. That's just not on, we can't have that. And then we influence our children, we influence the men around us. Um, and in terms of a genuine urban response, it's about policy and strategy. We need to get the jobs into our centres so that women can actually start to rebuild their lives. Um, in our growth areas, we need to deal with the housing products. We need to stop this car dependence and deal with public transport. I'm just going to whip through that. You know that we're all car dependent. But that makes it really hard if you're trying to rebuild. And it needs to be articulated in our vision so that in our KCC21 vision, we do say a safe place for our residents that you don't fear harm or injury. It's got to be articulated somewhere. So from here, um, my role is just to advocate. We did a submission to the parliamentary inquiry into crime prevention. I'm doing these sorts of conference papers and design research, and we continue to uh, raise this as an issue with developers and uh, in planning referrals and also with government discussions. So that's me. Thank you, Nathan. It was a really interesting presentation and you've certainly given us all plenty to think about. Um, has anybody got a quick question for Nathan? I can't see any there at the moment, Tracy, so we might let everyone contact Nathan directly if they're interested in asking any further questions. Okay. Does doesn't look like there's any questions at the moment. So um, if you'd like to contact Nathan, his contact details are at the end of his presentation. 
And we'll move on to the next one. Um, this second presentation has been pre-recorded for us today by Cheryl Han, who is a lead advisor in community investment. And that's part of the Ministry of Social Development in New Zealand. Cheryl has worked in family violence prevention for 21 years and has recently written an article on mobilising communities to prevent family violence. Um, she was unable to present live today, so she's pre-recorded her presentation and um, we're going to hear what she has to say on social change and community mobilisation approaches to family violence prevention. If, as I've said before, if you have any questions for Cheryl, her contact details at the end of the presentation. Hi everybody, I'm Cheryl Han. I'm from the Ministry of Social Development in New Zealand and I've been working on family violence prevention for the last 20 years. I'm going to talk to you about what we've been learning around mobilising communities to prevent family violence and um, show you a few of the examples of what's been happening in New Zealand around violence prevention within communities and let you know some of the resources that are available for people who are planning their own social change and community action projects. So just to let you know first, what I'm talking about around family violence is um, a whole lot of different forms of violence. Um, it means the same as domestic violence in New Zealand. So we're talking about violence by partners and by um, parents towards children and towards older people within the family, and it also includes dating violence. And also we're not focusing just on physical violence, we also include sexual abuse and sexual violence, um, psychological abuse, coercive control, financial abuse as well. So it has a really wide um, definition. In New Zealand, family violence is a really serious social issue. Half of all of our violent crime in New Zealand is family violence. Half of all of our homicides in New Zealand are family violence. Um, we know that it takes up a lot of police time. Around 40% of all police time is spent on family violence in New Zealand. That's one every five and a half minutes. And in rural areas, it can be up to 70% of police work. We know from WHO research, one in three women have experienced physical or sexual abuse in their lifetime. And we also know that only around 30% of all episodes of family violence is reported to police. So it's a huge issue. What we've been trying to do um, with the um, work in New Zealand is to create a supportive social environment so that we can do work to prevent violence by building up the um, risk, the protective factors, sorry, and by reducing the risk factors. And so we're thinking about what we can do other than provide services to create a supportive social environment so that violence can't even happen in the first place, or if it does people can get help early and get support from their community. So I've been part of the It's Not OK campaign um, until recently. The campaign's been working since 2007 in New Zealand and it's around changing attitudes and behaviours to family violence. And the campaign um, takes a, a national and local approach to um, work with communities to drive violence prevention. So we've been using this kind of approach around thinking of a supportive social environment and also thinking about mobilising all sectors of the community to take action. So that's what this model is about. It's the idea that if we want to stop violence, we need so many more people than just the police and the refuge and services involved. We need everybody, no matter where they are, where they live or work or play, involved in doing something to prevent violence. We don't all want them to do the same thing, but we want people to take ownership and responsibility about the issue and to know what their role can be. And then we also want people to be working in a coordinated way. Um, that's why it's a, a circle with a uh, one in the middle. If we can combine our efforts and all be working towards the same direction with the same outcomes, that's when we'll make a difference around changing um, family violence and preventing violence. So the campaign has been about uh, mobilising communities and there's also other things happening in New Zealand like White Ribbon and other campaigns, but I'm largely going to talk um, to you about what I know from the It's Not OK work happening in communities. And it's been about driving that community ownership and leadership. Now obviously the um, aim of the campaign is to end family violence and to prevent harm, the um, personal and social and economic costs of family violence. But there's also some intermediate steps that we've identified that if we work towards these goals, we know we're on the journey towards preventing violence. Because if we want to measure violence ending, that's like 
generations of work. Um, that's a real, really long-term goal. So we need to have some short-term goals um, that we're working towards in terms of social change and community mobilisation approaches. So what the campaign is seeking to do is to encourage more people to talk about family violence and to more, more people to understand what it is because we realise that a lot of people aren't aware of how serious it is in New Zealand and what actually uh, forms constitutes family violence. We want people to ask for help early because we know there's a whole lot of shame and stigma and embarrassment about the issue. It stops people getting help and means that many more people are harmed because they don't talk to those people around them. We want Fano, family, friends, workmates, neighbours, everyone around people to notice, to know what they um, when they see family violence and know how to offer safe, effective help. Because as I said before, um, only 30% of violence is ever reported to the police. The communities are dealing with the rest of the violence themselves. So we want them to take a stand and to um, change the attitudes to not tolerate family violence, but also show what safe and healthy, respectful relationships look like. So we're modelling the kind of positive behaviours that we want to replace violence with. So those are the aims of the kind of community work um, that's been happening around the country. And the campaign takes a settings approach. So um, talking to people about what they can do in their particular environment, in their area of influence to make a difference around family violence. And so that's what I'm going to talk to you about now just briefly. What's been happening in a few different locations. So first is sports clubs. There's a lot of work been happening with rugby league around New Zealand and some other sports clubs where coaches and sports players and members of clubs are thinking about their role that they can play in supporting families and preventing violence and creating a violence-free environment. And the whole messages around family violence prevention fit really well with um, sports clubs idea about um, family values, for being a family friendly place and also fair play. So it can be really easily built into a whole lot of the work that's happening within a team environment and by coaches. And many um, sports people in New Zealand have realised the role that they play as a kind of role model in their community and so they've been wanting to be involved in it. But there's a whole lot of stuff been happening within communities um, where people are taking the first steps to take some leadership around preventing violence. So that's uh, some of the images. I might skip through these a little bit, but you'll have to go back and have a look at them afterwards, after the presentation. The other um, settings is around thinking about what can happen within the workplace and within businesses, because we know a lot of people um, are worried about colleagues, or it's a place where people can be offered help, um, and that family violence does affect the workplace. So I think there's been more work happening in Australia around this, but it's just starting in New Zealand too, thinking about how workplaces can create a violence-free environment and just do a little to try and change attitudes um, by putting around resources and having people come in to talk about uh, family violence and how to get support, right through to developing policies within the workplace to support survivors, um, looking at uh, family-friendly policies, um, challenging gender inequalities, doing work to um, mobilise people across the workplace to think about the role that they have in preventing violence. So um, a lot of the local campaigns, local communities are connecting with workplaces and building champions in those spaces and doing training in the workplace. And there's been everything in New Zealand, right from the New Zealand Defence Force, who's developed their own family violence policy, right through to hairdressers in some of the locations, getting some training on family violence, um, developing resources, and knowing how to talk to their clients that they're concerned about. There's also quite a few faith communities in New Zealand getting involved in violence prevention, really thinking about what they can do to role model safe, respectful relationships, making it okay for people to talk about it, um, and knowing how to help people within their communities who are experiencing violence. And often that involves leaders within the community having to take um, have some brave conversations and take a stand and um, letting everyone else know within the faith community that it is okay to talk about violence and there's things that they can do that will make a difference to support families. And that's happening in lots of different ethnic communities around New Zealand too. And the value of um, people themselves deciding on their own messages and their own approaches um, means that the way that they talk about family violence can be accepted within their own community. So a lot of people find it too scary or too difficult to raise it as an issue, but coming in by talking about family harmony or um, respectful relationships or being happy within your family or being a great parent is a way into starting some work to talk about family violence and think about what they can do to prevent that within their communities. 
We've got lots of groups thinking about how they can use media communications to change attitudes and behaviours, and that's something that the It's Not OK campaign can support because they develop national messages um, and information and media tools that anyone can use for free if you're starting to think about the really early stages of communicating messages around family violence prevention in your community. But some really exciting stuff has been happening lately across several New Zealand communities where they've been taking a whole community approach to building champions. And this is about every ordinary everyday people getting some training and understanding family violence and how to talk about it, but also training in social change and community development approaches. And then going back into their spaces, whether it's into their school or into their workplace or into their own family or um, their neighbourhood, and really leading those um, community conversations, trying to increase the understanding, trying to challenge the misunderstandings and the stereotypes around family violence, helping to overcome the shame and encourage people to help um, get help early, or even actually providing that informal help when people aren't able to get to services. And we're seeing some really exciting things happening in communities, and there's a video of um, what's been happening in the Paeroa community up on the It's Not OK website and on their YouTube channel that I really encourage you to have a look at because you can see this fantastic partnership between the council and the family violence agencies and all sorts of great local people and the police and um, ACC and uh, Ministry of Health and other organisations all being working together around um, thinking what they can do to prevent violence within their community and really taking some leadership uh, around that. So the It's Not OK campaign's just released some new toolkits, uh, some new information for community champions. So have a look at the website. There's lots of stuff there about family violence and free posters and resources that you can order and lots of information about how to develop your own community family violence prevention projects. There's toolkits in there, but also you can contact them anytime if you want help to develop your own project. So if you need some advice about um, a local approach to family violence prevention, if you need some resources or some technical assistance, um, they also have a little bit of money that can help support community projects. So keep, you can keep up with what's going on in New Zealand by looking at their Facebook page. Um, there's also a toolkit that they've developed online for social change um, pr practitioners, for people who are developing their own projects locally, and this gives you a project planning tool um, and a way to um, think about what you, how you can build on the evidence base so that you are making sure that you're learning from what other people have done and you're learning from what the risk and protective factors are known um, around and what works. And also to let you know that the latest research and stats and information is available on the Family Violence Clearinghouse, that's the NZFCC, that's a place where you can access lots of information about community mobilisation and just pointing you to a paper that I was involved in writing around um, mobilising communities that got more examples um, of New Zealand pro community projects and also the theory and the thinking behind social change approaches to preventing violence. And just finally, a really cool um, diagram that's really useful for thinking about all the points and all the opportunities within the community where we can make a difference to preventing violence before it gets to the police or the refuge or child youth and family, all the people in our community who could know a bit more and do a bit more that would help prevent violence. So please get in touch with me. Um, let me know if I can help you or give you any more information or get in touch with the It's Not OK campaign because we're really keen to help local communities plan their projects, implement um, violence prevention and work together so that we can all learn about what works. Thanks. OK, we'll move on to the next presentation now. Our last presenter for today is Steve O'Malley, who is a leading firefighter and multicultural and indigenous liaison officer with the Melbourne Metropolitan Fire Brigade. Among the many things Steve's been involved in, he has been a white ribbon ambassador since 2007. Steve is going to talk to us today about gender and emergency management and effective primary prevention of gendered violence by emergency responders. Thanks, Tracy. And, um, and thanks to Megan as well, um, and I really appreciate the opportunity to say uh, to uh, a different audience and to some colleagues over in, um, in New Zealand and in Australia, um, just to give a bit of an insight into what uh, I do and what the organisation 
uh, does, our, our uh, organisation, which is the Metropolitan Fire Brigade here in Melbourne, in regards to violence prevention. Um, it's, a little, it's a little different uh, in the scheme of things. Uh, in that we we've been we've had a presence with the White Ribbon campaign since probably since I joined up as an ambassador in 2007, 2008. But um, more recently, I've been able to get some support uh, on the back of some amazing research and, and advocacy from the women's health sector, as in women's health in the north and women's health um, Golden Northeast here in Victoria. Um, post the Black Saturday bushfires in 2009. So what that means is that we have, we, we're able to be more strategic and not just fly the white ribbon as it may be, which is in itself is effective um, uh, when you consider the, the sort of um, the buy-in we get from community as a fire, so, a fire service, but also uh, be a little bit more strategic in how we do our core business, which um, which has to do with response, responding to domestic violence situations or domestic abuse, intimate partner violence, whichever term we use, um, occurrences, um, and how we can do um, uh, something which is pretty close to my heart, which is uh, gender inclusion, uh, which, which leads or alludes to the first slide up here. Um, as a male-dominated workplace, we've got, we're well placed to actually affect some pretty concerted change in, this, in the realm of violence prevention. It's a sector, the violence prevention sector, women's health sector, is, uh, is certainly seems far removed from the emergency management sector, but if we consider the determinants that are on the screen now, and I hope you can all see them, but if we consider unequal power relationships between men and women, the adherence to um, rigid stereotypes and the broader cultures of violence, we, as an organisation full of men, ultimately, and um, the stat to keep in the back of your mind is that we universally um, firefight, operational firefighters, m men take up about 96% of those positions and females take up about 4% and that varies from state to state and certainly internationally as well. But so as a male dominated, safe to say as a male dominated um, organisation, we can, uh, we can affect some pretty, some, some pretty incredible uh, changes well, to be seen I suppose, but by um, by chipping away at those unequal power relationships and the adherence to the rigid stereotypes. So, I mean, that's that's the sector speak there, but basically what we want to do is be an organisation that um, that embraces gender inclusion and inclusion of others. So, under, underrepresented groups mean people from cold backgrounds, from culturally and linguistically diverse backgrounds, and Aboriginal uh, or Indigenous Australians as well. So, um, the reason I'm so passionate about the gender inclusion stuff is because ultimately, if we do that, if we chip, chip away at the rigid stereotypes and if we see that we're a, a gender inclusive organisation and we have respectful relationships within our organisation, so firefighters uh, acting as a team and, and we have uh, you know, a, a, a fair and equitable gender split, which will never be a parity, mind you, but if we increase the numbers of females, well then we start chipping away at these, um, these stereotypes and the, the perceptions that kids and other adults particularly have about what it is to be a firefighter. Um, so uh, this is what we know about uh, family violence in the, in the, um, after a, a disaster or after a natural disaster. And, and we were lucky that um, well, um, when Women's Health in the North and Women's Health Golden North East had a conference, and I've got a slide that sort of shows the, the background to some of the work that they've done in research. So we had presenters from um, Christchurch Natural Disaster as well who came out. So um, we had um, uh, Lois Herbert came across and spoke, and, and I think the year after we had uh, Rosalind Houghton who came across in uh, pretty well known in the domestic violence sort of uh, sector over in New Zealand to speak about the effects uh, on gender basically uh, post the natural disaster. Um, so you can read that for yourself on the screen, but, but basically what, what uh, women's health, the research tells us is that uh, in, after, the, after a natural disaster, the, um, the compounding effects on gender is, is remarkable in that um, men, based on the gender stereotypes and the norms and the expectations, the big tough either frontline firefighters or you know, back of house firefighting staff or uh, community members that are actually in there doing it as well, or volunteer firefighters, everyone across the, the gamut, um, men react differently to women in uh, post, during, and um, and, and pre-disaster as well. 
so what we can do about that is we can actually uh, be innovative in the emergency uh, services sector, emergency response sector, uh, to uh, buck what is the norm uh, in that uh, that of the masculine, you know, heroic male firefighter, and um, and show that we're we're actually we're we're human beings, and that yes, men react differently and women react differently. Uh, the way that 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 presents as well is that men. Uh, there's a sense that well, the research tells us that there was a lot of self harm and a lot of male suicide post an event and. Uh, like Black Saturday, and, and after the event, the family violence went through the roof as well, and that was gendered as well. So violence against women uh, uh, was on the increase, definitely. So there became um, uh, there was the inlet there after um, all of the research from 2009. Uh, we we um, established the Women's Health in the North and and Monash Injury Research uh, Institute uh, established with Emergency Management Victoria, the Gender and Disaster Pod. The websites are here. I don't think I'll, I'll attempt to, to play the video, but I might at the end. 1-800-RESPECT uh, has been linked into the Disaster Pod, which is an online tool for emergency services and community sector and violence prevention sector people, workers, um, to uh, access a lot of resources um, to do with prevention of violence against women, prevention of gendered violence, and how, um, and a lot of it is very gendered heavy, so it talks about effects on men and women, as I said, separately, and it also speaks about the effects on, on families as well. Um, so there's some links there that you can uh, have a look at later. Uh, here's just a highlight of some of the flyers of some of the events that we've been able to spruik the gender, task, the gender and Disaster Task Force. Um, one with Liz Broderick and Angus Houston last year, which is 2015. At emergency management conference the year before, we we spoke specifically in the diversity stream of the conference about gender and disaster and the effects. Uh, these two conferences on the right hand side, the Just Ask, was how it affected men in 2013, and 2012 was the initial conference with our New Zealand delegate and guests, um, which was the identifying hidden disasters, the effect on uh, women, uh, specifically about domestic violence or family violence um, post uh, a natural disaster. In the middle there, uh, proud to uh, fly the colours of the Women and Firefighting Australasia Network, uh, and we have our, uh, I'm on the board of that network, and we have our conference later on this year, uh, and, and I'd invite anyone who wants to speak on family violence as a, as a, uh, a subject matter to, to maybe submit a paper to that as well and speak further. Yeah. Um, the reason why I'm involved in the Women's Network is pretty much, as I said, leading back to one of the earlier slides about the gendered norms, that if we want to affect some sort of change within our organisation that projects out to community, um, the impression is pretty much what you see here in that, uh, and I know these slides have been seen around a little bit, there's been a lot of gender stuff, uh, particularly last year with Rosie Batty as the Australian of the Year, and now uh, David Morrison is um, a champion of this sort of stuff as well. Um, you know, they're the norms that we subscribe to, men that are involved in engineering, say for instance, and uh, emergency services grunt work like police and fire. Uh, and, and medicine, and, and then uh, we have a female, hopefully she may be a doctor, but uh, the norms would tell us that generally speaking people would uh, have the impression that female in medicine would generally gravitate towards nursing. It's not always the case, obviously, but they're the impressions that we get. This is my favourite slide, and I know a few people will see this as well, but this is a, a, um, um, an exercise led in a primary school, and so this gives an indication as to what people are thinking about um, the gendered nature of emergency services, so for instance, in, in our case, and that's all I can speak to, because that's the sector I belong to, but although, as Tanya in her presentation alluded to, the work that's done in, in different settings like faith groups and culturally specific groups and uh, sporting clubs and workplaces particularly is really important. Um, and then, you know, what Nathan delved into with the design is, is vitally important because um, uh, people are at their most vulnerable quite often when they're out in public, um, although intimate partner violence is by nature happens in the privacy of, of um, our own homes. And the stats say it all, you know, women being, uh, you know, more than half of our population will be affected, or more than one third of half of our population will be affected sometime in their life uh, through um, uh, violence. Um, so the slide, so if you haven't already been able to decipher the, the, the issue with this slide to me is that this was a teacher-led 
primary school project where uh, kids sent out to the organisations to get some paraphernalia back so they can make a collage too. Obviously, thank the organisations for what we do as emergency services responders um, because you know we're high profile. Uh, we have a, a, a lot of regard in, in, the, in all of the ESO, the emergency services organisations, police, fire and ambulance, but the way they predict us uh, is um, a male-female ambulance officer, a male-female police officer is fair enough. The kids all came to that sort of agreement, but as I said, as a teacher-led organiser uh, uh, um, um, project, they couldn't come up with the concept. They couldn't even even agree uh, that maybe, just maybe, there may be a female firefighter out there somewhere. So they threw a truck into the corner as a, as a just to fill up the blank on that other side. So that to me is indicative of what society, and I know female colleagues that would agree in the, the women's network certainly, that uh, that perception is that you have to be strong, tough, alpha male, hetero, more times than not, you know, a proud, passionate, paid up family man uh, to be a firefighter. But um, we would like to, to beg to differ and say that um, uh, the norm would be uh, that uh, equality should be the thing that comes to the surface rather than than the stereotype or the myth that's out there, and that we should be inclusive in a workplace as well. Because if we're going to go back to those determinants and talk about rigid gender stereotypes and, and gendered norms, uh, we want to be able to portray ourselves to uh, the wider community, and uh, that we're we're um, an inclusive um, organisation, uh, and that men and women uh, can do exactly the same job in a in a place that. Uh, according to these primary school children, uh, was at once the domain only of men. <laughs> so that's pretty much. Um, I've got a lot more to say about it, but you know, time is of um, the essence, and it is getting on. So uh, I'll leave it there, except to um, put my details up. And I implore anyone to, uh, and as Nathan said before, to acknowledge the work of the story of the joint when we're talking about um, uh, their. Um, the stats on, on women that have been killed in intimate partner or just in violent acts uh, throughout um, Australia is really important to acknowledge that. The same way I acknowledge here the work of women's health in the north and Gold, Golden Northeast and, and Monash University because um, the partnership stuff is really important. We as an emergency services organisation, we can't do this on our own because um, it, people would argue it's not our core business, but I would always argue that uh, we're in the business of public safety or community safety. And as I said, if um, more than a more than a third of um, or a third of more than half of our population is affected uh, directly by violence sometime in their lifetime, well, as a high-profile organisation such as a fire service, we can actually do a lot to uh, prevent the, the um, intimate partner violence or gendered violence, particularly. So, thanks for the opportunity today, and um, I hope I hear from some of you. Thank you for sharing that, Steve. There's some really interesting stuff there, and you've, um, like the presenters that come before you today, you've given us plenty to think about. Before we finish for today, does anybody have any um, questions for Steve? No, I'm just looking. I think no, Stan was there and he had his hand up. Oh, there is a question. Let me see. Do you have any reflections on the public feedback, especially from the UFU on the leadership of the MFB and CFA and Minister Garrett to drive female recruitment? I, that was directed towards me, Megan, yeah. <laughs> um, no, look, I, I, we do, we, I, I speak on behalf of my, um, my role with the Women in Firefighting Australasia organisation because we're, and we're certainly not an industrial um, body. We, we advocate on behalf of women for professional and personal development and women that are um, interested in firefighting as a career because ultimately, you know, the consensus out there is that, um, you know, it sounds like a throwaway sort of line, but people will say, well, not every woman wants to be a firefighter, which is absolutely true and the same can be said for men as well. But if we don't afford them the opportunity to be a firefighter uh, through our, our networking in the women's network, which across the New Zealand as well, and New Zealand Fire Service are, are huge supporters of the women's network. Um, well, then we're we're doing a disservice because it, um, you know, ultimately, you know, gender inclusion is is pretty, or gender equality as well is pretty much the key to violence prevention. So, um, I've got I've got my, my opinion certainly, but 
as part of the women's collective, I would, um, I would, I'm free to say that um, I encourage all organisations to be strategic about how they recruit, and that I think, and you know, I'm a massive advocate on gender inclusion. Um, the way they go about it, well, you know, that's that's policy sort of stuff, and and organ there's always going to be a, a few uh, issues when you uh, question cultures that are, you know, in excess of a century long. Okay, so that was it for the questions. Okay, so on behalf of all participants, I'd like to thank all of our presenters today for taking the time to share with us. Um, please feel free to email any of our presenters with any follow-up questions you may have. And also, uh, a reminder from us to please fill out the survey on this webinar. Let us know any topics you'd like on these webinars, and we always welcome all feedback. Our next webinar will be on suicide prevention and it's on Wednesday the 25th of May. And just a reminder that the recorded webinar link will be sent, will be sent by email to all participants and be, will be available on the Australian Safe Communities and the Safe Communities New Zealand websites next week. And we encourage you to um, share these webinars with your colleagues. Thank you everyone for your time today. <laughs>